as you know, I have divided the pre-scene into four areas. And the first one is the industry, learning about the industry from the pre-scene. And we looked at uh, the bulk of the information available, but there was one section, this table, that I did not take a close look at. And my hope is that uh, you would have already done it now uh, that you had the week with you. Uh, but essentially, this table is simply a classification of how an airport in, in a very normal sense, in a very not, not in, in the creative sense of how people make money now in the modern dynamics of the airport operations industry, but in general, that is applicable to all airports across the board in the world. Uh, this is how revenue segmentation happens. So you have mainly two segments, but you can add this like for any business, you have a non operating revenue segment for any business. So that segment applies here as well. But mainly the two revenue segments are aeronautical fees and non aeronautical revenue. So under aeronautical fees, you have three main streams of revenue coming in. That is landing fees, which the airlines must pay every time an aircraft lands or takes off at the airport. And the rates depend on size, uh, time and facilities used. So that's one. The second one is passenger fees, again, paid by the airlines, a payment by airlines for every passenger who arrives or departs on one of their aircraft. And finally, terminal fees, which is basically a payment which must be paid for the use of terminal facilities to board and disembark passengers. Rates depend on the relationship and the airport present. So uh, basically the concept here in terms of terminal fees is you would have noticed that when you're trying to, you know, when you enter the airport and uh, you go through a particular crew, right? You check into the airport uh, through a crew and that crew is made up of your airlines, right? And also at the gate, when you're trying to board the plane, the crew that is taking care of, uh, it's a simple process, but the crew that is managing that entire operation is also the crew of the airline. So the airline is actually using a lot of services here. They're using the hangars, they're using the terminals, they're using the landing, they're taking off, and they're the ones who are driving the passenger volume. For all of this, they pay these three streams of revenue that falls under aeronautical fees, which constitutes of a relevant relative majority of the revenue stream. So about 56% in general uh, is made out of total revenue that an airport makes through uh, aeronautical fees. So that's the first main segment. Second segment is non aeronautical revenue. So that's, that simply means revenue that we make through indirect methods that are directly not connected to aviation. The, the concept and the methods that we employ related to aviation. So here we have car parking, retail and dining, car rental, fuel sales, advertising, recharging utilities, property and real estate. Some of these are directly received by the uh, airport operator. Some of them are done through third parties. So we get someone else to cater, to provide catering in the airport. And that is a third party. So we get Hilton to take care of the catering in, in one of the uh, launches. And what, does, what Hilton does is they take care of the operations and they pay a commission to us. So that's commission based. So you have, you can make the money through either commissions or directly, uh, but these are, and this list is by any means, not an exhausted list, right? There are, can be multiple areas, multiple ways and means of uh, non aeronautical uh, revenue streams that are not in this list. So this is just a example snapshot of the most common non aeronautical revenue streams that an airport makes. And finally, the non-operating segment that is just highlighted here, obviously, if we have bank deposits, we might make an interest revenue. Uh, we might get government grants and subsidies. So that's just a small element of non-operating revenue. And this is a snapshot of the general revenue classification of an airport. And, and we see the same applied to our company, our field as well. So this is very relevant to us. We have to have a very thorough understanding of this breakdown because we also make money in the same way. 
and I hope that that with that this part is clear, uh, which means that I'm going to move to the second main uh, extract of the pre scene. So the second part of the pre scene that we are looking at is the company itself, the the business known as Arfield, of which you are a senior finance manager. So Arfield here. Uh, you will notice that there's a 11 page extract out of your 35, 37 page uh, pre scene document. 11 pages is purely dedicated to learning about our field itself, which I have extracted for you separately. And um, you have several, you have a basic introduction, then you have its history outlined, and also the detailed airport portfolio so we have we own six airports so there's a table that outlines the details of these six airports um, four of them seem to be in norland itself which is our country our base country two of them seems to be out of norland right so international airports then we learn of uh, various you know different technicalities with respect to how we operate uh, the you know just a few details and then we talk about there's a piece a general piece on how airport ownership actually came to being how after the world war you know how a lot of military bases were converted to commercial airports etc cetera, etc cetera. so that history is played out for us to learn and they show us how cci became the first airport under the Arfield banner when airports became privatized right by governments so that is provided then we move on to an extract from Arfield's annual report where we learn about the vision vision and values uh, we learn about the current board of directors of Arfield so we, we learn you know quick summary a brief introduction to each of them and um, then we have There are responsibilities in terms of the executive responsibilities and the non-executive committee composition. Uh, finally, move, we move to the principal risk register, our field's principal risk. So those are the elements that the pre scene provides us. Uh, what we are going to do is we are going to learn the same through my pre scene analysis document. So what I've done as we did for the industry piece as well. What I've done here is I've created a more organized, a more um, something much more, you know, easier to absorb, right? Uh, pre scene analysis extract for you, which you can find in your pre scene folder. Uh, let's go through that and learn in detail about our company called our field. So a quick reminder. You are a senior manager of the finance function of our field. You report to the board and you advise on special projects and strategic matters. Uh, we are based out of Norland, which is a large developed country surrounded by the sea. Norland has a well-regulated stock exchange. The currency is N dollar and the Norland stock exchange requires companies to prepare financial statements in accordance with IFRSs. So, these are like very basic in every single pre scene that Sima has given out. I'm talking since like 2008. You see this, this paragraph is the same. It has not changed. It used to be IASS. Now it's IFRSS. Um, okay, right. A quick overview on the Arfield business. Uh, Arfield is a quoted company. So we are listed in this well-regulated stock exchange NSX with a beta of 1.15. So let me just ask you a simple question. Can someone quickly and uh, just, just briefly share with the session, share with us all what the 1.5 beta indicates? Uh, it has a relation between their debt and equity. Uh, uh, it shows the risk factor also. So, so the 1.15 means uh, uh, the risk factor of the company that's risk factor. Can you uh, maybe elaborate or can someone pick it from there? 
I agree. Sure, risk factor. Maybe a little bit more specificity into that. Uh, says uh, our investor wants to invest in a company. Uh, that time, the what kind of uh, current financial situation of the company is is a, a risk. Uh, the risk is 1.5, uh, 1.5. It's a more than one, you can say. Okay. Uh, that's maybe my understanding is right. Uh, somewhat, somewhat. It is correct. The approach is correct, but uh, it can be better. It can be better. Uh, sort of like the detail of it can get better. Uh, would would oh, someone li else like to take it from there, please? Uh, uh, the risk is about the market risk. Uh, so the risk factor is the market risk. All right. So if I, let's say, for example, I say that, um, so we have Skyline, right? So Skyline's beta is, I say it's 0 0.8. So now what does this mean? In relation to Skyline, are we better? Are we in a... What kind of situation are we in? I wouldn't say better, but like in, in the entire industry is doing well, we would do better, like at least by 15% better than the base time. But on the same note, like when the industry is doing bad, we would be uh, similarly like that 1.15 is kind of the surge and like an amplification of how the market performs and Skyline would like perform much better when others are performing worse, they would be like 20% less worse, less bad than others. Okay, all right. Um, any other contributions? I think the 1.15 beta, but that's just based on my understanding. I think it measures the volatility of our field's um, stock compared to the systematic risk of the entire market, which means the entire market is the aviation sector. So if it's 1.15 comparing with 0 0.8, it shows um, um, our field's um, risk um is higher than skylines in this case correct right so i think uh, in terms of detail uh, what jenning offered is is the closest uh, definition for the beta and what i want to point out here is that when you're going through your financials revision so i'm not going to explain in detail what the beta is here but when you're going through the financial strategy, F3 revision, uh, it's probably the second or the third video, uh, you'll find a good explanation on the beta factor and what exactly the beta means. We don't have to know how to calculate the beta, which is a very simple thing, covariance uh, divided, which is a statistical measure. But uh, we have to know what the beta means, not how to calculate it. So uh, here, as uh, Jinning said, Yes, the beta is a direct translation of the volatility of the stock in relation to the market. So that we consider that the market is volatile at 100% base. And if a company has a more than 100% or more than one uh, beta factor, it means that particular stock is high volatile relatively more than the market. If the beta of a company, in this case like Skyline, is less than one, the stock moves with a lower volatility in comparison to the market that's what it means so um in general but but you can learn about it in detail as you go along with the revision as well so thank you all for the contribution our field owns and operates six major airports four in norland and two overseas and we are norland's largest airport management company which is mentioned in a couple of times uh, here and there uh, throughout the pre-scene if you read in terms of revenue and in terms of the number of flights we service. So um, it's undoubted when you lo actually look at the financials, uh, given that Skyline is our closest competitor, that we are way ahead 
and we are the biggest airport operator in uh, in Nolan. The journey so far, a quick look at the history. So the company was founded in 1980 when Nolan's government privatized airports. We started with acquiring Capital City International Airport, CCI, which seems to be our like, biggest uh, place of operation. And our head office is also uh, very closely connected to Capital City International, even geographically. By 2005, we were operating four terminals and CCI. Uh, the fourth one was entirely leased to Norfly, which is the main airline in Norland. Uh, Nolan's largest airline and CCI reached slots and operating capacity in 2002. We acquired Capital City Max in 1994. So that's a quick, just, just a brief history on the company. Don't get too hung up on the details here. The case study is by no means about the history of the company, you know, whether you remember which airport was uh, acquired in which year. Those are not the major focus of the uh, case study or the paper. The paper is all about you know the future and the strategic projects what you're whatever you're going to undertake but just a brief history for you okay let's take a look at the aspirations of the company vision i like the vision it's a very straightforward and a very relevant vision uh, to be the world's best airport company and very easy to remember also so now itself you can just put it into your mind we work for a company which is an airport company and the vision of the company is to be the world's best simple the mission, how we want to become the world's best airport company is by creating sustainable growth in shareholder wealth while respecting the needs of other stakeholders, particularly staff, passengers, customers, and the communities who live and work alongside us. So obviously shareholder wealth is going to be spoken about, right? There is no business private entity vision, mission statement or aspiration really without shareholder wealth. So that's, that's a big part. But we want to grow shareholder wealth in a sustainable manner while taking care of all other stakeholders who are in the mission statement named to be staff, passengers, customers, and the community uh, who live and work alongside us. Again, not a very complicated uh, mission statement also. It's a fairly um, simple one, very easy to understand and absorb, but has a very open-ended nature to it as well. So it's, it's very broad. Values, safety and security of our staff, our passengers and our customers, delivering on financial and brand promises and commitments, excellence in all things by paying close attention to the needs and wishes of stakeholders with high standards to maintain that confidence. Always learning by paying close attention to industry trends and changes. So we want to be always learning. We want to be at the forefront of innovations in safe, secure, and innovative airport operations. With a we can do that attitude or culture by empowering staff to deal with problems in a calm and constructive manner. So these kind of terms can be very, very useful to remember. In And one thing that you can like just check out from the previous papers even, what you notice is the value statements play a big role of uh, the SCS because the values drive strategic decisions. The way we do things, it is primarily driven. It's coming from our value, the method of conducting and you know executing operations. It's coming from this value set. So we want to ensure safety and security. We want to deliver on our promises. We want to excel in all things. We are always learning and our attitude is we can do that. To do this, we pay close attention to stakeholder needs. We pay close attention to industry trends and changes. We want to be very innovative and we empower staff. So those are action points that you can extract from the value set. So have a very good understanding of our values. Remember the five values. Remember what kind of actions we take in order to ensure these values are in place. So this is very important because one thing that we notice when you're writing your answers is your, even though you're writing to the CEO, the questions you get are of strategic nature. It's about the business. So you're, you're practically writing like the owner of the business. And if you talk to any business owner, 
you know that everything they say is driven by their ethos how they think all the decisions they make all the speeches they make all the boardroom you know discussions and the steer code uh, verbal uh, retorts they make everything is coming from there so the values are important because we have to write like a business insider our field insider we have to understand that these are the values that we need to stick to um so please give a little more uh, time to this and uh, make sure that you remember them all right next we will summarize um the operations how exactly does cc uh, does our field operate the top level leadership head office is located on the perimeter of capital city international each airport is its own sizable business and has a dedicated team of management so we don't belong to these teams that is very important to understand we don't uh, we are not part of any of these dedicated teams of management managing each airport so we have six airports the six airports have their own dedicated team we are in the team that manages those six teams the board reviews performance reports from the head office and the board maintains close contact with each airport management teams so please think of it like this we have a board structure we have a central team leading uh, and then we have six one two three did i yeah four five six all right forget about this so we have six teams that are managed under the main board of directors and their team and we are part of that this is where we are so you can just think you know okay what kind of organizational structure is this what kind of uh, structure might be the best fit here um, are there actually cross functional teams that can operate across the airports you know there are various questions that you can think about when you visualize this kind of uh, company structure of how our field is managed uh okay next uh, let's talk a little bit about these airport management teams themselves uh maintain they maintain good relations with all airlines they also work closely with regulators such as the northern air traffic control service they have considerable discretion so already we know that part of the value system is empowering employees so that nicely matches with this statement they have considerable discretion but major investments to be approved by the board and airport managers are expected to deal with problems quickly and efficiently so managers seem to have a lot of discretion they are expected to deal with problems quickly and efficiently and that is what we know um, as far as these individual teams that are managing the airports go um then we have airports are heavy dependents dependent of it systems clearly yes i will show you proof as we go along today of how to what extent actually are airports dependent on it but if you have a passenger experience you already know this system support usual activities such as financial record keeping etc and operational activities like managing passenger baggage scheduling gates managing electronic locks etc are all looked at so it is a huge part uh, of managing our airport but not only our airport actually any airport and i think this is the um that is from iata which is a global the global regulator of airspace um and here you will notice that this page if you actually spend about you know 10 15 minutes in this page you will realize that iata actually looks at air travel in terms of the perspective of cargo baggage passenger and aircraft and in all of these segments yeah 
ऑफ एयरपोर्ट एक्टिविटीज एडवांस्ड प्रोसेसिंग इंटरक्टिव डिसीजन मेकिंग सो अंडर ऑल ऑफ दीज सेगमेंट्स वॉट यूर बेसिकली वॉट यू विल बी एबल टू सी इज अ स्नैपशॉट ऑफ हाउ आई टी इज बींग यूज सो हि यू हैव आई टी अंडर लाइक आई क्लिक ऑन इंटरक्टिव डिसीजन मेकिंग लिंकिंग एवरीथिंग टूगेदर विथ ट्रस्टेड रियल टाइम डेटा थ्रू आउट द जर्नी सो वेन यू हैव टाइम यू कैन वॉच द वीडियो but situational awareness where apis airline industry data models are being used data driven management tracking like smart tag sensors connected device technology will be deployed etc etc uh, so you have the sub technologies here cargo one interactive cargo baggage tracking one order um actions and change management so cargo facility of the future interactive cargo etc etc so you can actually click on each of these links and the idea is not to you know really extensively read and become like become an iata employee no the idea is to be familiar of to what extent has technology overtaken different elements of the passenger and the baggage or cargo journey so when you have that familiarity you'll feel more comfortable around the idea that okay i know really that airports are heavily it dependent and practically i've seen it i've seen what next this next project says so that brings me back to our discussion in the pre scene i told you that you would have already seen that there's a table right there's a table which details all the six airports with a brief summary and you know giving additional details about the six airports we own and what i've done here is in the analysis sheet there is a single table that summarizes all of this data under the heading our fields airport portfolio snapshot and the main headings you will see in the table airport country invoice currency hub status runways and the number of runways terminals number of airlines cargo freight and other details so let's go through uh each of the airports just to just to you know kind of refresh ourselves our memory about the airports if you have already read them uh capital city international is in norland obviously norland uh, the base currency is in dollars we know this cci is a hub airport with two runways four terminals 70 airlines with cargo freight operations this was the initially acquired airport four terminals out of which one is entirely leased by norfly one of world's five largest passenger airports and also among largest cargo airports it has 10 hangars no fly has exclusive access to six of them and annually it processes in excess of 63 million annual passengers so cci seems to be heavy duty it's, it's uh in the in the league of uh, los angeles lax or heathrow uh in the league of those airports then we have ccm capital city max so you will notice capital city here which means we need to understand that capital city is the capital city literally of norland and we have two airports already with ccm norland n dollars it is also a hub airport with two runways two terminals 58 number of airlines 58 airlines going through it with cargo freight facilities it's a hub for no fly and air farland smaller than cci yet it's one of world's 10 largest passenger airports then we have capital city business so this is the third airport we are seeing that we own in capital city three airports in the capital city of our base country by our company what does this mean It seems like we have heavy we are a heavy hitter uh, in terms of uh, you know aviation uh, market share in capital city of norland Nolan N dollars, but capital city business is a non-hub airport. It's not a hub airport. It's a spoke airport. It's a connector. Um, we have one runway there, one terminal. Thirty-seven airlines go through it, and yes, it does have cargo uh, freight facilities. It's located on the outskirts of CC, capital city, and it's relatively small and attracts business travelers. The cargo facilities are designed for courier. and allows a 40 minute boarding window 
which is uh, which why they've highlighted is because you can notice you can connect a few words there now this is a business oriented airport and you know how businesses right businesses want to be efficient which means you don't want to be like the whole point is not coming into the airport and staying in the launch and relaxing for three hours that's not it the 40 minute boarding window allows people to enter the airport and within 40 minutes and right? they don't need to like there's a rule here um, and and most of my experiences have been like you have to get here before one hour before two hours i even like earlier earliest flights i i've taken when i was young i remember uh, three hours i had to go to the bandarnaik international airport here in kalambu three hours they explicitly said you have to be at the airport three hours before and like for three hours we were just just roaming around so um here because it's a business oriented airport which means there's a lot of business travelers and the 40 minute window is a short time window where their time wastage can be or time slippage can be very little that brings us to the fourth airport in norland but not in capital city which is hope city international hci uh, it is a hub airport two runways two terminals 52 airlines go through it and does yes of course it's a hub airport so it's very likely i, I mean uh, not having cargo freight facility in a hub airport would be um, just unacceptable so yes of course uh, obviously it's located in hope city which is the second largest city in norland 500 kilometers from capital city one of world's 20 largest passenger and cargo airports so again hci also seems to be very big then we move on to the final two airports that we have we own but not in norland so one is a major link international which is in esland e dollar uh, is the main currency esland so this is the second currency we seem to be associating major link is a hub airport with three runways three terminals we don't have specific information about the number of airlines and cargo freight but it's very likely because it's a hub this is a yes uh, don't get too you know uh, lost in those details those are minor details this was acquired in 1998 located in major which is capital of estland it's 1800 kilometers away from capital city across the sea it's the main hub for air as world which is very likely the main air line of estland uh, operates frequent services to hci so there are frequent flights from uh, hci to majolik finally we have prairie bird international in farland so the third currency we are coming across the third currency that the company deals with it's a hub airport with two runways two terminals uh, we don't know how many airlines it's okay let's not worry about it but yes it does have cargo freight facility it's one of the largest airports in farland uh, intercontinental flights hub obviously it's 6000 kilometers from cc so we know that estland is closer and farland is farther farther from uh, norland uh, capen air no fly and air farland offer regular flights to cc m just a little bit of a tidbit okay so important pieces of information the trivia on the airports i'm not very you know you don't have to like you don't have to worry about uh, you, you don't have to worry if you're thinking okay do i need to remember the number of terminals of each airport no you don't have to right but um one thing that we can extract from this summary is the number of currencies so now itself you should understand that we deal we are a company like for example i can tell you when we had uh, this company called kctp which was a science and technology park operator it was one company based in one location in one country so there were no multiple currencies being going through transactions internally but that is not the case with your situation your precinct here for you your you you work for a company where it seems like there should be a treasury team because we have multiple currencies being used we are probably being paid in the three currencies and we are being we are paying in the three currencies so there are transactions happening uh, which exposes us to this entire segment in financial strategy called currency risk so you should know what type of currency risks are 
how do you understand them how do you mitigate them what are the different tools that we have what are the internal tools what are the external tools so you have to have a thorough understanding on that aspect so that is one thing uh, i would like to highlight here heavily uh, other than the fact that i already touched on the fact that we we seem to have a very near monopoly in capital city and we are very strong in nolan and one of the reasons it looks like because uh, we have three airports in the largest city and the capital of nolan one airport in the second largest city of nolan so we seem to have a very strong uh, presence in nolan um so you can at your own you know uh, time spend some time on this uh, it's a very easy table to absorb and you spend a few minutes here uh, you will have a thorough understanding a single snapshot in your mind about the six airports we own uh, four in noland three of which are in capital city one is in hope city two outside one in island one in fall that's it uh, there are five hubs and only one non hub which is again easy to remember which is the business airport which we have in capital city called capital city business um all right so that is the next uh, that is the part we looked at from the pre seed here <clears throat> that brings me to our fields board of directors okay so um <clears throat> there is one image that you can just easily absorb here which i haven't brought into the analysis sheet because of the single table i didn't want to kind of you know make the document lengthier but this is just a graphical snapshot of the six airports as i mentioned uh, four in noland three in capital city the yellow is the spoke uh doing uh, two different countries so exactly what we extracted from that table all right so uh coming back to our analysis our fields board of directors uh first question how many executive members and how many non executive members do we have here from the pre scene Um, I think there are three um, non-executive members. Which, um, I know that this is for Monday. Then four other members. Uh, I think I got it. That was three. Um, um three executive. Three, three non-executives. I think. Um, Three non-executive members, an additional non-executive chairman. If I'm not afraid, sorry for the background. Please, it's okay. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a it's a welcome thing. I'm glad that uh, um, you know Eric's probably it's it's Eric's son, I hope, uh, or, or or daughter, or you know someone very young is also attending the session. So thank you very much for getting them to be part of the session. It was really welcome, um, and. Uh, Yes, so we have four executive members. We have a CEO, COO, CFO, and CCO. Uh, we have a chairman, who is a non-executive, which is a non-executive role, uh, but but a different kind, a different kind of a non-executive role, uh, rather very independent, so to speak. But three non-executive directors um, sitting separately. So one chairman, three NEDs, four executives. so the whole question about okay is the chairman like is this board balanced and does it have to be four equal four four executives four non executives uh you can argue both in both cases but the clear answer here is yes you can say yes uh because the chairman doesn't really get involved in executive responsibilities so the chairman provides leadership for the board uh in p3 there is an extensive discussion on and uh, the role of non executives and the directors what their responsibilities are so you will have a thorough understanding when you're going through that at which point if you have any further clarification and questions you can always bring back to our session here but let's take a closer look at the uh, executive team here 
So one thing I want to you know kind of highlight here is it might be good if you can remember the names because you know we are working with this team. You have been appointed as the SFM. So the CEO is Marcus. The two names that you might have to, or three names that you might have to like really remember and get familiar with is Marcus, Romuald, and Kamiliata. Those are the three names. So Marcus is the CEO. Anna or Anna is COO. Romuald is the CFO who is our direct report. Uh, Hengchi is the CCO. Uh, Marcus, of course, Marcus' responsibility is to lead all the uh, or lead the board. Uh, Anna is in charge of building and facilities management, airfield, airfield, airfield operations, airport security, health and safety, repairs and maintenance. Romuald is in charge of accounting and finance and IT. So the CFO of this company. Uh, who we have a very close connection to, and it is very likely that most of the emails of all the variants will be from the CFO. Generally, we see in the SES, it's the CFO who is writing to us. On the off chance, there are questions where the CEO is also writing to us. Those are the like most common instances we see. Again, nothing to get hung up on. Whoever writes to us, it's the same, right? They are a board member. They will ask about us about a serious matter. And we have to give them a very valid, relevant, um, precise answer. Henchi is in charge of marketing, HR, customer relations, and public relations. So uh, you can just spend some time looking at the experience highlights. It might be helpful here and there to remember a thing or two about each director. It might not be the contributing factor, but when you're writing an answer, if you want to kind of be illustrative, and let's say you're talking about uh, something related to pilots. A pilot union has caused some issue with respect to an airline and the airline isn't like the, the flights are all stacked. They're not taking off. And uh, in such a situation, you might be able to, you know, tempted. You might be tempted to say, okay, we can bring in Anna here uh, because Anna is a trained commercial pilot. And she might, and an ex chief pilot who might have connections to the pilots' union, et cetera, et cetera. So that is just illustrative points you can bring in. So, in to that effect, it might be a little helpful to remember a thing or two about each of these, uh, something that, that hi is highlighted about the roles, but it's not a major requirement. But um, having an understanding of the responsibilities can be important. So, very simple. Remember, Marcus is the leader of the board. Romuald is in charge of accounting and finance and IT. Uh, Hengchi is marketing, HR, customer relations and public relations, which means all the kind of operational matters like related to specifically related to airports like health and safety, airport security, airport, airfield operations, uh, building and facilities, repairs, maintenance is Anas. That's the um, executive team. Let's take a look at the non-executive. So the leader of the board um, is the chairman, Kamaliata, who is sitting in all the independent committees. Uh, Martin is, is sitting in the risk remuneration and nomination. Hesham is in the audit and risk. Anna Maria is in uh, the audit um, remuneration and nomination teams. Okay. Now I want to ask you a Simple question here. Is it okay for the chairman to sit in all the independent committees? So here you see uh, Kameliata is the chairman. Chairman is sitting in all the committees. Is this all right? Any thoughts? Um, and yes, I just saw the uh, response, Jinning, thank you, correct, four EDs and four NEDs. Um, Azman, I suspect <laughs> the possibility of some form of um, um, self-review threat in the sense that the chairman, who is ultimately the leader of the main board, sitting on all the other committees, Eventually, those committee committees reports come back to the board for either ratification or subsequent um, approval. Um, I don't know if it's assuming 
the committee social decisions or uh, make a report. We already have knowledge of that report or have made input in that report. And as the chairman of the board, which will be reviewing the same report, I, I don't know. I don't think there's some form of um, discomfort to that um, position. Um. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric. But uh, to be really honest, I only got some pieces of the um, of, of what you said because of, uh, you know, because of the noise, which is okay, which is perfectly all right. Uh, but but I feel like uh, from what I got, I feel like you were more toward the yes, yes, it's all right. Uh, for for the uh, chairman, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, but please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, um, sorry for the interruption. I think I was rather of the view that it's not too all right. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Right. Okay. Um, in the sense that, in the sense that, um, my suspicion is all these committees report. Yes, yes. I'm on the phone. All these committees report back to the board. Right. The chairman who ultimately takes responsibility for the board. It's a member or possibly the chair of these other committees. So eventually he has to review, as chairman of the board, review reports that he already either has made input or has um, um, approved. Okay. So I uh, foresee the possibility of issues of self-review. Right, right, sure. Self-review, which, which puts the position at risk. So are you, is the position actually very objective? Is it serving its purpose? A small interjection there. If I ask you a question this way. Um, so you said you mentioned that the all these committees report to the board. Is that right? Did you say that? Uh, sorry, I didn't get a question. The, question. Uh, the question was, uh, like what is the primary, like in general, why, what is the main function of these committees for you and for everyone? What are the, what is the main function? If you generalize, what is the main function of having these committees? Okay. So if I, if I remember clearly, the audit committee. Um, so uh, I think Eric, you're cut off, but can someone else also take over, uh, add a little bit here? Yeah. Uh, hi Rajesh here. Hi Rajesh. So, yes. uh, uh, as to, uh, say about what is audit committee in risk and remuneration and nomination, right? So uh, the, the final yeah. question, like for me, I, I, I'm not expecting a specific answer for each committee. Okay. Audit does this risk does this not like that, but what is the main function of having these committees, uh, these independent committees? What okay. is, what is the purpose? Yeah. So these committees actually ensure the integrity of the company and the fairness, uh, having a majority of non-executive, those who are the kind of not related to executive decisions directly, and they can take a decisions independently uh, to we make a more sustainable and and the decisions are more sustainable uh, if it is coming from a non-executive chairs. Right. Okay. So so the decision making will be a little more uh, sustainable and and uh, independent of the. Of, and, and the fact that they are independent of the executive team can make it more, uh, can safeguard the company's integrity. Sure. Uh, any other additions uh, to this? Um, Asman, I think my understanding is that the chairman can sit on the uh, all these four committees, but the chairman cannot chair the audit committee. That's my understanding. Um, right. And the purpose in general, if you generalize the purpose of having these committees? Uh, the purpose of having these general committees, because these are the independent uh, 
non-executive directors, so they will be able to uh, contribute to the strategic decision making, so they can bring in their expertise and 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 uh, 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 engage with the uh, discussions, and um, uh, they can monitor and challenge any decisions, inappropriate decisions made by executive uh, board, executive directors. True. Right. Right. So. Uh, any other thoughts? Anyone else? To have more accountability for the executive. Uh, sorry, Amal, uh, I didn't get you. So that the executive board has more accountability towards the other stakeholders, like to maintain the interest, best interest of the other stakeholders, like the non-executive com committees could act as a act on a line. Not, I'm not talking about the two-tier board, they would have a supervisory role to the executive committee. Right, supervisory role. All right, okay. So, um, got it, noted. Um, anyone else, anything? May I continue? Okay, so this is good. And uh, all the answers, now Eric was not very, you know, for uh, the chairman sitting in the committees, uh, while Jinning was uh, more, positive about the fact that, okay, the chairman can sit. So this is the thing. Uh, and, and the primary uh, question I asked later about the purpose, the general purpose of having these committees, I expected two words in your explanations and uh, all the answers were true. And all of you were very correct. Uh, so uh, brilliant and, and good job there. Thank you very much. But the word is corporate governance or other governance, good governance. The whole point of having to establish these committees, why we live in a world today when we shouldn't. I mean, what's the point, right? But we have had to establish these committees. We have had to establish these supervisory roles for the executive teams. We have had to uh, establish independent board committees that look at indep that independently review decisions, reports, outputs, outcomes of the executive team because of governance issues. So governance is, is this is where P3 comes in and you have a separate video on corporate governance in which to great extent all these aspects with respect to EDs, NEDs, their responsibilities, the committees, what they're supposed to do, everything is discussed. So you can actually learn about all of that or refresh your memory about all of that through those videos. But the whole purpose is governance. Uh, it's almost like you can't trust the executive team. And it's a little blunt when you put it that way, but, but that's the point. Like you can't trust them because there have been so many scandals along the way since uh, the 1920s. And by the time it was too late, we had to figure out a way to, you know, kind of stop this and put some control. Uh, and the control that the world came up with, the, 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 the modern economists came up with, or this, this particular capitalistic model came up with, was corporate governance structures. And we have the different acts, right? Sarbanes, Oxley Act, uh, different acts, and under which there are voluntary uh, codes that companies can adhere to. And this is all happening under the UK corporate code of governance, which is slightly different to the American version. Now, in terms of the first question, so that is the purpose, but in terms of the first question with respect to Kamaliata, whether Kamaliata can sit. Okay. Now that's why I mentioned that you can be uh, open-ended. I, and I liked how Eric put it. He said, not too much. I don't like it too much. Right. So that is a valid answer because you can't completely agree to this. You can't also completely disagree to this uh, because whatever said and done, if Kamaliata is sitting in all the committees and if the committees make some kind of decision um, that, that has Kamaliata's involvement and then later it comes back as a review process, you know, where you have to review this decision, but the starting point of this process was a recommendation that came from that committee for which Kamaliata was involved. It is biting back, right? As a self-review, you're reviewing something that you pitched and you initiated or you recommended. 
So in that case, there could be minute um, self uh, con minute conflicts of interest. But then the counter for that is having other people. So that's why you have other people. And that is where I agree with Jennings, which even the book talks about uh, Jennings um, suggestion where it's okay, but you have other people. So you can't get the uh, chairman to chair the independent committees. The chairman is the chair of the board, not the chairman of the independent, not you cannot chair any of the independent committees very, very specifically the chairman is not supposed to chair one committee that is not acceptable at all, even in the off chance, because we don't have the expertise, because we don't have people or in the interim, we might appoint the chairman as the chair of uh, some of the committees here. But there is one committee that the chair cannot, is not allowed to chair at all. And that committee would be? Nominee. Audit committee. Yes. Correct. So that committee is the audit committee. The chairman by no means uh, can chair the audit committee. And in fact, the person who is going to, who is supposed to chair the audit committee has to have certain criteria. He, he or she has to fulfill certain criteria. One of which very commonly known is uh, being an expert in financial statements, having financial background, uh, where SEMA uh, members very beautifully fit into. Right. So uh, perfect. So with that discussion, I hope we've clarified that little uh, detail as well. So once you revise your P3 segment on corporate governance, all of this will, the, the theoretical knowledge and the practical discussion here will nicely fit in. And then you can even, you know, bring in any further questions you have on this matter. Uh, wonderful. And uh, okay, on that note, Yes, Martin, please. Yes, I, I was looking. I'm looking at uh, at the executive uh, directors, uh, especially that uh, we've been told that uh, the airport industry is highly dependent on the IT, and the looking at the IT, the, the information technology. Is sitting under finance. Correct. So I was thinking if we can have a department uh, of IT uh, looking at uh, say that it's the ID, uh, the airport industry is highly dependent on the information on IT issues. Thank you. Uh, so so um, that that last part, Martin. Please, uh, can you uh, uh, repeat, please? The question is. So is it is it okay for IT to sit under the CFO? Is it? Yeah, my question. My question is that uh, I'm thinking we should have a department of IT separately. It is, separately, yes. Not the way it is uh, where it's sitting under finance. Agree. Uh, we've been taught yes. So the the matter at hand is this. The concern, uh, very, very well justified and is uh, well noted and you have opportunity to highlight this and you can take this into the strategic analysis is where the information technology and we've already established that uh, airports are heavily IT dependent. And so it's, it's, it's seemingly obvious also uh, and it can apply to anything and everything. Uh, there may be other aspects that are not covered here. There could be factors like a very common thing that a lot of people, you know, easily catches where is legal. Right? This is a listed company. Legal is going to be a big aspect and customer relations and public relations is embedded under the commercial officer. So maybe you can remove this at legal here and establish a different uh, director. So that's another director. These are just potential uh, suggestions uh, it definitely because of the fact that we are heavily it dependent uh, is it justified that the cfo has to take care of this and we don't really see uh, a lot of it exposure here so is the cfo 
really well qualified to oversee the IT side of this business. Uh, will it not be more fair if we bring in another external director who is a specialist in this area and establish it as a separate uh, executive branch? So these are all very valid questions. So thank you very much, Martin. It's uh, very true. I'm sure that everyone thought about it as well. You can bring it in under uh, the strategic analysis. There are a couple of questions where you can bring this up as well. Um, so excellent observation. And I hope uh, everyone caught that as well. Um, brilliant. So on that note, I am moving on to the share price. So this is the share price snapshot. Uh, just there's not much we can gain here. We don't even see exactly the numbers, but uh, we can make a few simple deductions. One is there seem to be reasonable volatility over the past five years. And that very nicely connects with our beta of more than one, right? Our beta is more than one. So you know, the, the whole, the way the graph fluctuates, there seems to be relative volatility um, justified. It's, it's actually at 1.15, so not bad. Uh, and not too much either. Uh, there are there have been dips, a couple of dips here during March to April 2017. Uh, there are peaks during November, December 2018, and another peak here. Um, as of uh, the latest reporting date, 30th April 2021, it seems an estimated $27. So just an estimation. It's not an exact number. We don't know the exact number. So you can just say, you say estimated. Uh, if you ever want to pitch the number in but other than that there's not much we can learn from this uh, but the fact that uh, we are not doing too badly but we also haven't done too well comparing the five-year period because if our price was 25 dollars in the long term we've only gained like a couple of dollars on that over the long term so there's a lot of arbitrage being made because of the price volatility, it's going up and down. So trading happens and obviously investors must be making money uh, by longs and shorts and et cetera. But when you look at it from a very long-term perspective, what has happened is a very simple, maybe a rough $2 uh, increase. So if the uh, market capitalization was the number of shares, right? Number of shares um, into MPS, uh, five years ago, now it's number of shares. So MPS 2016. So now it's MPS uh, 2016 plus two. Right. But we might have paid a lot of dividends here annually uh, over the five years. So shareholders might actually be happy. We can take a look at that and try to understand what kind of dividend policy we have, how much do we pay, uh, what's the dividend payout ratio, all of that, when we do the financials analysis to see are they the um, facts or the, the reasons, the driving forces, or do they contribute in some way to the share price volatility here as well. Uh, but this is it. This is as much you can extract from the share price table. Um, on that note, okay. Uh, a quick look at our field's competition. So there seem to be multiple operators in Nolan. Uh, uh, I have one question on share prices. Yes, uh, please. So general tendency, like if, if question comes, it comes to comment on the share prices and there it, it, it creates a kind of situation where it will say there is a no uh, major movement upward or downward. So how do we communicate with the shareholders? Okay. Or that we are going to increase the wealth of the shareholder. That's how the question uh, gets uh, like scenario gets uh, to answer. So in that those situations, what should be our strategic approach to answer to include the dividend uh, policies or uh, how how do we structure that? All right. So uh, interesting question, but let me uh, bring it here. So the question specifically is um, that 
so the scenario that you said was that we are doing something and because of that the share price is not moving is it yeah so like look at uh, if, if you look at the graph it is a, a kind of constant uh, like in long period long term okay sure so if we want to make some big move or something how right. we are going to convince uh, that kind of okay so um historically mps has not um moved greatly um small increment but if we wanted to provide a massive or uh, to boost the uh, mps by a large amount how can we do this uh is that right rajesh or do you want to add anything to yeah. this yeah and how do we communicate uh, uh, to the shareholders why we are not uh, making all right so how do we uh, justify the the marginal or the small capital gain yeah to the shareholders right the capital gain is simply the the difference between the share prices of uh, when you bought sure. the price and the current price so the capital gain is small how do we justify that how do we tell the shareholders uh, these are the reasons why it didn't grow by this much so a uh, good thinking and uh, a good question not too difficult to respond as well so i leave it there is is there anything else that anyone wants to add along these lines hey, any queries uh, asman it seems we lost you along the line yeah for a moment we lost you um how is it now yeah now it's stable it's stable now all right so now you now now everyone can hear me i hope yes please thank you um all right so there's some some internet disruption we are having heavy winds uh, uh, across the uh, the indian ocean these days right on top of our country like this heavy wind blowing uh, i was afraid that i wouldn't have power uh, today because half of the day in the morning i didn't have power here i was really worried about that as well thankfully uh everything was fine by the evening uh okay so uh, not a too not too difficult but a good question uh so there are things to think about here uh one is okay you can look at it from the perspective matters right so you can either answer to this question from the perspective of the board of directors as a director you can also look at it from the investors perspective right so when you are thinking about the board now i'm not trying to give the exact answer to this question now itself but i'm trying to you know give you some pointers to start thinking about it because end of the day what really matters or what will really matter is what the exact question in the question paper is so we don't specifically know that because of this only i'm trying to give you this kind of structure of how you can very widely think about it so the question might lead you to thinking from the board's perspective or the question might lead you to thinking from the investor's perspective or some other perspective i'll i'll show you today there's a good example also now uh, when you're thinking about it when you when you want to think about the share price right from the board of directors um okay. obviously market perception matters to you right because the market perception is how the share price moves from our perspective if we are the board is if the price is going up it indicates to the trust that the market has on us if the market trusts us when we make a decision if the price is going up it means that the market is trusting our decision they think that because we made this decision we're going to make more money because of that they are buying more shares and because they are buying more shares the price is going up so it's it's really that kind of connection 
and um, also uh, there are other factors like our strategic uh, priority right so there are certain projects where we are not really worried about the capital gain it might be too early to think about that we want to take a risk and we want to you know kind of deep dive into the project where we are not really care we, we don't really extensively care about the impact because we know in the long run after five years we're going to reap the benefits so it's it's really a matter of the the risk perception of what we are going to do so there are factors like that that we can bring into our answer when we are talking about the share price do we care about it do we not are we sure that it might increase how do we mitigate risk etc right so these are there are so many things that we can think about from the investor's perspective um very simple one is the return so investors are focused on return uh, return is made up of two things dividends and capital gains so investors might be happy i'll i'll bring in another factor here which you must touch on which is actually the type of investor because there are sometimes there are institutional investors who only care about long term profits so they just want to invest in stable stocks that are giving long term stable returns there are short sellers and short traders who you know make them their money daily by trading volume uh, so it really depends on the kind of type of investor because that will drive their motivation some investors don't care about the long term now in our um table this table it looks like what happens is here looks like it hasn't been really good for any institutional investors who have held on to the stock from this day to this day but someone who held on to the stock from here to here uh, must have made like 25 so this is like uh, 37 somewhere here so that's like almost about 12 dollars gain if they had sold off the shares here so it really depends on you know the kind of uh, i the investors have are they actively trading are they really are they like warren buffett who is always every day in the morning when you wake up you look at your stocks you look at like in the night, every hour you look at your stocks and you try you make swift decisions or are you just someone who is you know who invests and you're waiting and you're hoping that in the long run it will just keep on increasing and one day there will come a day where i need to cash in and when i want to do that uh, obviously the price will be much greater so it really depends on the type of investor on the one type and the other is the return expectation because depending on the type we might be able to justify to an investor saying uh, look you're not interested in capital gains right as long as we give you consistent dividends like what apple does right so what apple does as a company if you look at apple's dividends um uh apple has consistently given out increasing dividends and on top of it consistently even in some occasions especially when the trump administration came in reduced the corporate tax rate uh, got some of the cash they were they had strapped in ireland back into the country uh, gave out cash in terms of uh, uh, share buybacks also to investors so they were just making that's why apple is such a uh, attractive share because right okay capital gains from the other aspect because of the operations and you know how how the market works but consistently increasing dividends are being paid out so you can trust the company to be a long term investment where you're not really worried about the capital gain but more about the dividends so these are all matters to think about so we will see there are questions i hope this clarifies the thinking behind how to answer that kind of question uh, uh so many aspects yeah. to think about uh, yes please so on that note i am moving on to the principal risk register okay but i'm going to postpone this we will start our next week's live session by looking at the principal risk register um and that marks the end of the second segment for today